Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Derek Khanna. He is a Yale Law Visiting Fellow at the Information Society Project. He's formerly at the Republican Study Committee. And we're going to talk about why that's formerly in a little bit. Derek, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. You are a uh, law school student. You're a fellow at a Yale Law program. Uh, you recently wrote a couple of articles about unlocking cell phones and how that's now totally against the law. Explain what unlocking a phone is and what rule that's falling, you know, that runs afoul of. Sure. So unlocking your phone is when you allow for your phone to use the SIM card of another provider. Right. So this is like you, you change the phone or you, you hack the phone a little bit so it can go from being a T-Mobile phone to a Verizon phone. It's even a easier than that. Yeah. You take your phone, you plug it into your computer, you push a few buttons mm -hmm. on an unlocking program, and now you can use your phone on T-Mobile or Verizon mm -hmm. or whomever you so choose. And now this is illegal? Yes, presumably so. Okay, and how do we know it's illegal? The content on your phone is a protected mechanism that's under the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of right. 1998. That oversaw various kinds of intellectual property claims, copyright laws. Yeah, it was, desi to it was designed to protect yeah. copyright. Right. And so any uh, attempts to get around those protection regimes um, are considered to be in a violation of 1201 of the DMCA. Mm -hmm. And so your phone has this material on it, and so trying to get around it through unlocking it is presumably illegal. Uh, the Librarian of Congress was authorizing a exception every three years. Mm -hmm. So by them choosing to remove the exception, now it's widely presumed, and courts have held in other cases in similar situations, that this would be covered under the DMCA, thereby triggering the criminal statutes. And what, what kind of penalties are we looking at, both on the books and then do people actually get charged with sure. hacking their phones? So you could be looking at up to five years in prison and half a million dollar fine, in, a diff in addition to the civil penalties, which are a little bit different. Um, and uh, so far, no one has come under these criminal penalties mm -hmm. um, as far as after the exception lapsed. Uh, but people have been threatened with these in the past. So Motorola has sent out letters to people saying, you could be liable for up to five years in jail, uh, cut it out. Yeah. Why did the Librarian of Congress uh, remove the exception or, or not renew the exception again? Well, the explanation given was basically that there were already uh, products on the market that allowed for you to buy an unlocked mm -hmm. phone at uh, $700 or so, uh, a much higher price point. Because you pay, if, if you want a phone that is compatible with any system out of the box, it costs more money. Well, they or, choose to or, make yeah, it cost right, more money. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, the price is set much higher. Yeah. You wrote a piece for The Atlantic about mm -hmm. this, which you know just went ballistic on Reddit, the uh, social media sharing site. Uh, why do people care so much about this? Why is this an outrage? Because it's a basic question of property rights. Who owns your phone at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. And if, if this is allowed to stand, then the answer is that you don't own your phone. So this is something that was asked for by one or two wireless companies. Mm -hmm. But T-Mobile, up until the decision, was asking their customers to unlock their phones and come over to them. Right. So it's a real problem for the free market. And unfortunately, American consumers have slower wireless speeds than most other advanced countries. We want more competition in this dynamic market. And this is a decision that's going to lead to less competition, higher thresholds. So, entry. I mean, this is a classic case of crony capitalism, really, where a couple of you know, major corporations, for the most part, are able to go to Congress or, or Congress's agents and say, hey, you know what, we don't like the provision of this law. Would you change it in our favor? I feel like it's even more nefarious mm -hmm. than that, okay. which is that in 1998, a poorly written statute, the DMCA, was passed, and it prohibited a wide swath of commonly used technology in the name of defending copyright. And I support and, copyright. Yeah, and uh, well, let's talk about copyright in a second, but to go back to the DMCA, explain how the DMCA is the reason why we all rip CDs, but we do not rip DVDs. Sure. So the technology on your DVD, that protection scheme, um, if you try to uh, rip the DVD, if you try to basically encode that DVD and, and put it on your computer, that's a violation of the DMCA. And in fact, even discussing how it would be possible to unlock your, your DVD, mm -hmm. these are the techniques that you would use, these are the codes, right. could lead to your website being shut down. This isn't hypothetical. Right. Websites have been shut down because they taught people how to unlock DVDs, and, but, and, and this backup is, DVDs. This is because DVDs are covered under the DMCA in a way that CDs are not. That's correct. Right. Yes. So CDs, just for uh, historical accidents really, 
They're like old records where you can tape, make copies of those on tape legally for personal use, DVDs, even talking about circumventing copyright encryption or protection, that's a federal offense. Yes. So let's talk about copyright because you said uh, you know, you're in favor of copyright. You mm -hmm. wrote uh, last fall, you authored a memo for the Republican Study Committee about why copyright was problematic. It was uh, three myths about copyright law and how to fix this or how to address it. Run through the main argument of your memo, which then became quite controversial, and we'll talk about that in a second. Sure. Well, you know, I'm a strong supporter of intellectual property, and I'm a strong supporter mm -hmm. of copyright. But the Constitution actually says that Congress has an obligation in this arena. It's one of their delegated mm -hmm. powers. But unlike the other delegated powers, it actually says why it's a delegated power. Yeah, and explain that. It says it's for the purposes of advancing the sciences and the arts. Right. The, you know, among the myths that you discuss in your paper is that copyright actually is there to compensate creators, uh, for instance, that copyright uh, represents the free market at work, and that the current regime actually leads to greater innovation and productivity. Mm -hmm. None of that happens to be true, right? Yep. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that copyright when the Constitution was written, you, if you were an author or a creator. You got 14 years. If you were still alive at the end of that, you could renew it once for 14 years more. Yes. Where are we now in terms of copyright law? Well, it was even a little bit different than that. Okay. It was 14 years if you chose to opt in. Right. You said, I affirmatively want to use this copyright protection, and most authors chose not to use it. Yeah. So the default was that you didn't have copyright, and it was only for a few limited forms of media. Mm -hmm. Today, any form of media is automatically copyrighted, and it is copyrighted for life plus 70 years. And that means uh, if and I were to- that's for individual authors, and then for corporate authors, it's- uh, what, about 95, 95 years, years from yes. publication. And wh when you say everything is copyrighted, when I send an email, that email is copyrighted. copyrighted. You yeah. write a note on a napkin to your friend. Right. That and, and this is distinct uh, in part because in the past you used to have to apply to the copyright office and say, hey, I want this to be copyrighted. Yes. Now it's just done automatically. Absolutely, yeah. So what are the problems with copyright? Well, there are a lot of problems with the system that we've transitioned to. Mm -hmm. So our founding fathers wanted a period where copyright would eventually expire. Mm -hmm. So most profit is derived in the first 10 years, and then it really is declining after that. So what happens is, is the content producers, after those 10 years, most of their work isn't mm -hmm. read ever again. But what we see is when work eventually enters the public domain, when it's available for free, then viewership and readership actually goes up. So mm -hmm. the, the content producer all of a sudden has their work to a whole new audience. Mm -hmm. So the founding fathers were aware of this, and they liked the idea that eventually all work would go in the public domain and everyone would be able to learn from each other's work and they'd be able to buy, you know, build derivative works off of others. And this is also, uh, I mean, this inheres in that, the rationale in the Constitution for copyright. It isn't specifically so Walt Disney can get rich, it's rather so that society yes. has more stuff to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. And we had a system that was analogous to that for, you know, century, well, for over a century. And they started to extend it slightly, but they, they had reasons to extend it. You could argue today with the market conditions that we have, perhaps 14 years isn't the appropriate term. But today where we have it, uh, life plus, uh, life plus uh, 70, 70 years. Yeah. And uh, what happened was, is every time that copyright was about to expire for some of these um, profitable works, mm -hmm. lobbyists would come to Capitol Hill and they'd say, hey, we really need it to be life plus 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then 30 years they'd come back and then they'd say we need it to be life plus 50 years. Right. And then, then they said it needs to be life plus 70 years. So it's very clear what their intentions are. Well, and now the Republican Study Committee is, uh, you know, it, it is a group of self, uh, self-identified, self-described conservatives mm -hmm. who want the government to be limited. They want it to be within the constraints of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Your memo was up for a little while and then it got pulled. Why was it considered so hot an issue that conservatives, I mean, you're not talking about gay sex, you're not talking about immigrants. You're not talking about cutting defense spending. Mm -hmm. You're talking about copyright. Why was this too hot to handle? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I, I don't know. You don't know, but, and you were never told why, okay, we gotta pull this down. Um, I wasn't given a real reason on why it was pulled down. Okay, are you not given a real reason or you're not at liberty to discuss it? Uh, <laughs> and I realize you are a law student, so you, know, you can put your best face forward. Well, I, I, yeah. can, I can tell you that the memo was, you know, not that out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. My job was to push... And was it vetted properly? Did it go through the various authorization mm -hmm. channels? Mm -hmm. Okay, because 
there was some talk that, oh, this one got out, no, and it was published no. by mistake. My job was to push the box and bring in conservative ideas uh, that perhaps hadn't been considered but were well right. versed by the conservative community. These were ideas that had been percolating in the conservative community right. for a long time. And so this memo was approved through all the normal channels, and it actually went through additional mechanisms mm -hmm. and checks and balances and revisions. Is it simply a political uh, position for Republicans possibly to say, you know what, we need copyright reform, which actually allies you with a bunch of hackers and activists that tend to be on the left in the computer world. Is, is this mostly political posturing or is there something, is there a deeper commitment to constitutional uh, legislation? Well, I can tell you why I wrote the memo. Okay. It was constitutional fidelity. Yeah. Is this really black and white what the founders wanted? And it's black and white the system that we have today. Mm -hmm. And as far as conservative principles go, uh, I, I think that we've really stifled innovation here and we've depressed the amount of content available to the public. What, what are the reforms you would like to see? So there's a large amount of works that are called orphan works, which is where you can't identify who the content producer is. And that's a result of copyright term of life plus 70 years. We have to track back who these authors are. Um, and, and particularly in corporate own, ownership, uh, you know, movie companies, movie studios yes. go out of business, record companies go out of business, or they go into mergers and stuff just gets lost. Yes. So everyone loses as a result. The, you know, you imagine the original author probably wants their stuff to be read or disseminated. Mm -hmm. Their families aren't making any money and the consumer can't listen to the product or read the books. So there are lots of solutions that you could imagine where Congress could fix this problem. And the content industry, which says they represent the artists, should also agree with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there are some more more difficult. So that, and I'm sorry, that might be that we just create a, a sense of if somebody doesn't claim the the copyright to something, then it goes into after a certain period of time, it goes into the public domain. That's one solution. Yep. Another solution is to allow for an automatic licensing and have mm -hmm. a reserve fund for those artists. Mm -hmm. And if their families come forward, then there's this reserve fund. And you use some of those funds to try to investigate who the artists are behind right. that music. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of solutions on the table, mm -hmm. but allowing for all that content to be unavailable is not a solution. Right. Uh, and now it's, uh, I believe it's 2018 when the copyright on Mickey Mouse, yes. uh, arguably the most uh, you know, lucrative copyrighted uh, material around, mm -hmm. comes up. Um, what, what do you expect is going to happen? Uh, in 2018. What kind of legislative battle will there be about that? Well, I'm sure there are going to be vested interests who are going to try to extend, once again, copyright, um, mm -hmm. perhaps life plus 90 years. But it's kind of theater of the absurd. I mean, anyone who, who knows what they're, who actually has read the Constitution will realize this isn't the, the limited times that, are, that our founding fathers were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, our founding fathers rejected the idea of an indefinite copyright. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is something that's very alien from our founding. And, and because they recognize that intellectual property is not the same as real property, that it is a government granted monopoly. Yes. For, and so it needs to be for a limited period of time. And that's what the British courts held. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a challenge to this uh, in the British courts. The House of Lords decided this is not a natural right. This is mm -hmm. something created by government that's beneficial, but created by government. Mm -hmm. That's what the United States Supreme Court decided. And that's what our founding fathers decided when they put this in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And not just our founding fathers in Washington, D.C., but actually across the country, each state had their own copyright law. Mm -hmm. And their copyright laws reflected this. So both at the state level and at the federal level, our founding fathers were well-versed in this, and they all chose to reject the argument of natural rights. Uh, where is uh, reform going to come from on this? Because, I mean, you, you tried to express this through a conservative Republican group. Uh, Democrats in mm -hmm. general are not interested in this. People like Al Franken and other liberal Democratic senators are very much in the uh, corner of big entertainment companies and of extending copyright and expanding it. Uh, where will reform come from? I don't think it's a left or a right issue. I think mm -hmm. that there are pragmatic members who want to find the answer. And when you're telling people that they can't unlock their phones, mm -hmm. or when you're telling people even more egregiously that uh, blind individuals can't access adaptive technology to read Kindle books unless they get an exception from the library and Congress, mm -hmm. this, is, this is crazy. I, I, I challenge any member of Congress to be against a bill that gives adaptive technology for the blind to read. And, and so these are some positive ways to move forward. And I'll give you one more uh, that I also think is just as important. To me, one of the most important parts of the First Amendment is protecting political speech. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the second worst violation of that is not by the government, but by individuals through a heckler's veto. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the DMCA has authorized 
a heckler's veto of political speech. Yeah, talk about that briefly. Um, you know, how, how can they get away with uh, limiting specifically political speech? That's what's in the First Amendment, Absolutely. Right? So this is what I find so problematic, is in 2008, John McCain had a number of campaign videos up on YouTube, and an individual filed a takedown request with Google and said, we'd like you to take down this content and it infringes upon our copyright. And so Google abided and took down the campaign videos for two weeks in the, in the thrust of the election cycle. Mm -hmm. And in 2012... What was the nature of the um, infringing material? No, there was no infringing material. Okay. It was, it was a fraudulent claim. Mm -hmm. And in 2012, with Mitt Romney's campaign, the same thing happened. And perhaps the most egregious example of this was in the lead-up last year to the SOPA discussions, Mike Masnick... That's the Stop Online Privacy yes. Act. Uh, Mike Masnick with TechDirt did an analysis on SOPA and why he thought it was a terrible law. The exact mm -hmm. thing that the First Amendment is designed to protect. Mm -hmm. But yet Google was given a takedown request and uh, Masnick found out one day when he searched his own article that it was no longer in the top results. Mm -hmm. And he contacted Google and Google said, oh, we took it down because of a takedown request. Mm -hmm. And this is Google, which is known to be perhaps one of the better operators right. in this field. But you've created a world where one individual or a handful of individuals who don't like content or speech can take down that content or speech for potentially political reasons. And obviously, again, I support yeah. copyright. When you have you know, pirated material, that needs to go. But enabling a system that allows for a heckler's veto is not the solution. Is, uh, is it that under DMCA, when you get a takedown order, do you have to comply in good faith? Or does Google, are they supposed to investigate? You have a very strong incentive to take it down mm -hmm. and then investigate and right. find out after the fact. So this really is like the, the heckler's veto, it's or, the heckler's or veto. you're shouting down, whereas at least for a short period of time, And again, likely these are people. easy solutions, right. which yeah. is, again, let's, we obviously the piracy issue is mm -hmm. a serious problem, but let's deal with this one particular issue. Let's say if you file a false fraudulent takedown request mm -hmm. with absolutely no evidence behind it, that's clearly for political machinations, that you will be fined half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Or at least you will uh, be stuck using T-Mobile as your carrier <laughs> for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's what, yeah. it would stop it in its tracks. Right. Um, and, and, and if we're serious about this, you know, why would content supporters be against that? You're actually strengthening mm -hmm. the best part of the DMCA from their perspective. Well, we're going to leave it there. Uh, Derek, where's the best place for people to read your work? Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm publishing quite widely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Atlantic and the National Review are uh, hosting some of my uh, content. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We've been talking with Derek Khanna. He's formerly of the uh, Republican Study Committee. He writes widely about the intersection of public policy and information technology. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.